whole time. Um, but I want to I want to uh, get right into the word. Uh, we're still in the middle of, of this, or actually we're kind of three quarters of the way through this two year uh, odyssey in in, uh, in 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 the kingdom of God or researching the kingdom of God, and. Um, Today we get to talk about something that's, that's uh, you normally don't talk about it in church. This is something that is normally talked about um, at groups after church, you know, like, like, a, like a Wednesday or a Monday night, you know, and, and the church opens its doors to a group of people you would never usually see in church. Um, some of them may look scruffy, they have tattoos on their arms, uh, some of them may be business people that are coming in, but... They're groups that usually reach out to those who have addictions. And I know this is interesting that we're talking about, I'm going to talk about an addiction on Independence Day, because that's what we want to be free of, right, is addictions. We want to be, we want to have our Independence Day from that. But today I want to talk to you about an addiction that I think we all need to have that God says is important. And it's interesting, as you look through what's going on in our world, addiction is running rampant. Uh, you know, many people have addictions to one or multiple things. Uh, some are negative addictions, like drugs and alcohol and gambling. Uh, but believe it or not, there are a few, I think even within our secular world, there's a few that are good, like exercise and eating well. Now, I eat, I eat well. I eat a lot. <laughs> I like to eat, right? But there's a lot of people that are addicted to the, the, you know, the eating of the vegetables and drinking good juices and, and running, and, and are, 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 they're just good addictions. And this morning, I want to actually go to a verse in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 16 that actually takes a very positive look at a certain addiction that I think every single Jesus follower needs to have. So if you turn your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we're going to be looking at verse uh, 15. Now, if you have uh, what, what is considered the only, uh, one of my friends told me it's the only version ever to have in your, in your library, which would be the King James Version, you will actually be able to read along with me. Because I'm going to actually do something different. I, I, I don't do this often, but I'm going to read the verse out of the King James. Are you ready? This is, this is quite exciting, actually. Uh, this is what Paul says to the church of Corinth, chapter 16, verse 15. He says, I beseech you, brethren. You have to say it with that, that voice. I beseech you, brethren. Ye know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Man, may God bless the, the reading of the King James Version. Amen? That was that was pretty weak. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, that was different, I know. We, we're just not used to the King James, but I wanted to read from the King James because of the way they translate a certain word, um, and you could probably figure out that what that word is. Now, the Greek word for addicted is the word tasso. Tasso, uh, it, it's just the way they interpret it, and, and the King James translation translates out as an addiction. Now, it's funny because if you look at the meaning of the word, it doesn't really mean addicted. It's, it's, it's really strange the way uh, the definition reads, but this is the way they translate it. And if you look at the Bibles, like the Pew Bibles or the NIV or the NASB, um, they actually translate Tasso as devoted. And, and other, other uh, translations they do different things as well. But for the sake of the illustration, I want to play off the King James understanding of this word tasso, of, of addicted. Now, as I mentioned, in our culture, addiction is a, it's a bad thing, right? I can get an amen for that. Addiction is not a good thing. Um, we, we know that addictions, uh, especially when people have addictions and they come to church, a lot of churches treat people uh, kind of, you know, they, they, there's like this negative, shameful, judgmental... Um, you know, attitude, and we don't have that here. We, we just, we really try to, to love everybody when they're coming through the door. And, um, but, but in society, and especially in, in, in religious circles, there's this truly embarrassing, negative, shameful, judgmental stigma attached to addiction, right? 
if we're addicted to something, it's usually a bad thing. But I want us to think about what if we were addicted to something that was noble? What if we were addicted to, to a noble cause, a noble habit? What if we were addicted like the house of Stephanus? What if we were addicted like what they were addicted to? I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if we were all addicted to a ministry of serving one another? I mean, that's what the house of Stephanus was. They were addicted to the ministry of the saints, which, was, which basically was to serve one another. Now imagine what our families, what our neighborhoods, what our cities would look like. I mean, they would totally change if we were addicted to serving one another. And so this morning, I hope to convince you all why it is a good thing to have this addiction. So why should we be addicted? Very quickly, there's three things. The first thing is this. We should be addicted because it fulfills the law of Christ. Think about this. Paul writes about this in Galatians. We fulfill the law of Christ when we carry each other's burdens, when we, when we bear one another's burdens. And therefore, we are encouraged by that to do good, right? To do good to one another as we have an opportunity. I mean, Paul really teases this out in Galatians 6, where he's like, if you bear one another's burdens, if you pick one another up and you pick up their, uh, somebody else's burdens, um, you do it every time God gives you an opportunity to do it. And it's interesting, in our culture, a lot of people are like this. They, they don't want you there. And it was the same in the first century. They don't want very private culture, very, you know, secretive to what they did in their families because they didn't want to be judged by the guys that wore the pointy hats in the synagogues. And so they didn't really, you know, the, the neighbor didn't tell the other neighbor that, oh, well, I have a problem with this or that or the other. And it's the same thing today, especially with social media, right? Because it seems like on social media, everybody puts out their business and everybody knows what's going on. But here's the thing, if we're addicted to the ministry of the saints, then we are more likely to employ our opportunities that God gives us to fulfill Christ's law, to fulfill his work. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Second, uh, this proves that we have the love of God in us. Um, last week, we were talking about this, that we can't have the love of God in us if we do not love one another, right? We cannot, we cannot love our fellow man, whether they're a Christian or not, a Jesus follower or not, unless we have the love of God in us. John actually wrote in his first letter, he said, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whatever or for whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love his brother and sister. Now, isn't that interesting? I mean, John just puts it right out there. He leads up, though, to this admonition. If you look back in that chapter, he leads up to this admonition by telling his readers that loving our, loving our brothers and our sisters uh, indicates that we've just simply passed from, uh, from death to life, that we've came from darkness and, and worldly beliefs to light and, and, and kingdom beliefs. We have moved from the pettiness uh, of our childish and paganistic ways, and we've made that, that positive jump to maturity in Christ as we dispel the doubt of his love is actually residing in us. I mean, it is an amazing thing when you see a, a new believer and they're struggling in their walk, and, and you could see them, you could see like the devil is pulling them back right? And then all of a sudden, it's an amazing thing when you see them make that jump, and then they become like super Christian, you know? And they're, and they're out there, and they're ministering to people, and they're doing the ministry of the saints, and they're loving on folks. And you just, you can see that jump when they finally dispel the darkness, when they allow God to have their entire life. And here's the thing, if we are addicted to the ministry of the saints, that is a, it is a positive sign that we are truly the children of God, and that he has got us lined up for something incredible. Now, the third thing is that this fulfills our role 
in the body of Christ. See, God intends, God intends for each and every member of the body to be concerned for one another. Let, let me say that again. God intends for each and every one of you to be concerned for each and every one of you. Right? That, I mean, that is, that is the, the, the most important point of the gospel is that we are loving one another, that we are concerned for one another. Paul actually tells us that God puts us together, that there's connection. I mean, a relationship is one of the most important things in church. Would you, would you agree? Relationship, it's all about relationship. It's about our relationship with Jesus, and it's about our relationship with each other. You can't come to church and just sit in the back row and get up and go out every day and not connect. That's not the way God designed it. I've had many friends that have told me, oh, I just want to be on a mountaintop by myself and, and, and study and pray, and I don't want to ever be around people. And I'm thinking, you're missing the most important point. Because if that would have been the case, then Jesus would never have came. God just would have snapped his fingers and there was no relationship. But Jesus came to build relationship. Jesus pulled together 12 men and their families. And by the time Jesus died, there was hundreds if not thousands of people following him. And they were connected. They were a church. They were people. Okay? And so Paul tells us that God put us together, that there should be no division within the church, that if one part suffers in the church, every part suffers right along with it, right? When we got a prayer request that Sharon had had a stroke, every one of us was like, oh. And what, what was our next thing? We fell on our knees and prayed, amen? We prayed for our sister to be well, and God answered our prayers, and she is at church a week later. Oh, and her birthday was tomorrow, by the way, too. Happy birthday. Yesterday. Yesterday, your birthday. And she's 29 again, by the way. So just remember that. Wish her a happy birthday after church. Now, if one part is honored, right? Paul says that every part is honored. We celebrate our sister being well. We celebrate her birthday. Everybody celebrates together. That's why on, when we have birthdays on Sunday, we sing happy birthday on Sundays. So next year, Sharon, we're going to sing happy birthday to her right? Because we celebrate together. We honor together. And when one part is honored, every part rejoices. That's why God says when, 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 a, when a soul, when a person comes to Jesus, the angels rejoice. Because when one part rejoices, everything rejoices. This is the way that we grow in Christ. Like I said last, last week, this is the most excellent way. Because it's the way of love. Amen? And in order for us to grow, or grow as we should, every, every one of us as members of his church must do our part. If we are addicted to the ministry of the saints, we need to. No, wait, let's scratch that. We will do our part. We will do our part in the body of Christ. So there are both personal and there are noble motives to becoming addicted to serving one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And with that being said, here are a couple thoughts before we go to the table on becoming addicted to the ministry of the saints. Uh, the first one is this, is that, you know what? We need to get to know each other, right? Like getting to know other Jesus followers in the body, it is a requirement. It's not a suggestion. It's not. We need, we should be, it is a requirement you think about the, the, the great orator, Will Rogers once said, I never ma met a man I didn't like, right? Well, let's, let's put that into Jesus speak. Let's put that into Christian speak. How about this? I never loved a person I never met. Now, I mean, think about that for a second. Unless we know each other, I mean, truly know each other, there, there is little hope for us becoming addicted to serving one another. I mean, if we just walk in and out the door every day without getting to know each other, then it's just, it's just a social club. We need to be truly addicted to knowing one another, loving people we haven't even met. You with me? Getting to know people, believe it or not, actually requires effort. That's one thing we need to, we need to make sure we do, is we need to put out the effort to get to know people. A former colleague of mine once said in a, we were in a local, 
uh, pastors meeting uh, where a bunch of pastors came together from different churches. And, and this guy, he's not, in the, he's not in the pulpit anymore, um, and this is probably the reason why. He said this, and, I, and I've actually coined this phrase once in a while just because I heard it from him, and I always think it's funny. But this guy was, I remember him vividly saying this, and he was totally serious. He said it with the utmost sincerity. He said, church would be easy if it wasn't for people. <laughs> and he lasted like another four or five months in the pulpit, and, and he quit, and now I think he sells insurance. But, I, I mean, seriously, though, what is the church made of? People, right? Church is people, and the best thing about church people is that God made them, and we need to get to know each and every one of them. Amen? Why? Here's the, here's the kicker. Why do we need to get to know them? I want you to do this real quick. Look to your right and left or behind you if you don't have anybody beside you. Look really quickly. Look around. Remember that face. You know why? Because you're going to be in eternity with them. You're spending eternity with these folks that are in this room. How amazing is that, right? <clears throat> so we need to spend more time than just an hour and 15 minutes together every Sunday. Okay? We need to do whatever it takes. We need to do whatever it takes to be connected. So that when one person is absent from church, and this has been the, the pain of the last 18 months, it's so hard because I, I, for, for, you know, for my first 12 years here, I could look out on a Sunday and I could go, and in my mind, I know who was here and I know who wasn't here. And I could call them or one of the pastors would call them and, or you know, maybe if a lay person called and we would check in on them, hey, how you doing? Especially if they're gone for two and three weeks at a time. Um, if they didn't call back, you know, you got a little worried. Right? In the last 18 months, staring into a camera or only having limited people here, it's, it's hard because you don't know who's doing what. I mean, there's people that are hurting in our, in our congregation. There's people that may never come back to church because they're afraid, and that's, and that's scary and sad. But we have to have connection. We have to have connection. Uh, other people... You know, when, when, people are, when people are absent from church, some people, they get on the phone. Um, some people just show up and knock on somebody's door. That's always fun, right? But what it does is, is uh, it requires us to actually go out of our way and show hospitality. Uh, Romans 12, 13 says that. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now, we all look at hospitality in a different way. I, I was very fortunate. I'm very fortunate now to be married uh, to somebody who does hospitality well, and she had, her family does uh, hospitality well, and you guys have been blessed by that for many years. I had a great opportunity as a child to be blessed by hospitality uh, at my aunt and uncle's farm down in Albany. They showed, I mean, their hospitality was always so f uh, friendly and warm and comforting. It's like I went down there every summer vacation, and then they would send me back here. And I always looked at that as home. People have asked me uh, when I was, you know, where, where, where's home? I, a lot of times I'll say Albany, because that's where my aunt and uncle were, and I, and I really looked at that as being home because of the, the, the level of hospitality that they showed. But here's the thing. That hospitality is so much different than, than, than this, this, this cold, hands-off, keep-your-distance attitude that you see with a lot of people in our world, and even in some churches, right? You ever been to a church that's done that, where they just stay away, or they just put their head up and walk the other way? It's so prevalent in our society today, and we can't, we just can't do that, because it's the love of strangers that opens the heart in the home and turns them into friends. I want you to hear that. It is the love of strangers that opens heart and home and turns them into friends. Excuse me. <clears throat> there is a willingness in the Christian world, or there should be, to visit and to be visited. I used to love the times when I would go and sit with Barbara McCorkle when Barbara and Don were alive. 
or where Dean and Grace were alive. And, and um, <clears throat> I always love the times when uh, we were just talking about Grace this morning. I always love the times when Grace would, she would disappear into the kitchen and come out with egg salad sandwiches. Now, if anybody knows me, I don't do eggs. I don't like eggs, but I choked them down. Boy, I tell you. But it was so sweet because they would, they would just show so much hospitality and they loved having a visitor come. And um, we need to do that. We, need, we must be willing to visit and to be visited. And now that all the restrictions are lifted in the state, we need to visit more often. Amen? We need to get out of this being trapped in our houses. You know what I mean? It's been so nice seeing people's smiling faces when, when they walk into church and we're not fettered by these muzzles um, that we don't get to see how people are. We must visit and, and be willing to be visited. We must know each other well enough to actually like each other enough to take the chance to actually love each other. And that's the thing I love about this church is that people are truly in love with each other. They truly do. Um, it, is, it has been a, 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 great, uh, a great time watching people, uh, especially as the restrictions have been lifted, and watching them come in and reconnect and, and just love on each other. And you know, if we're, if, we're, if we're going to truly be concerned about each other, then we need to go to the Word and we need to glean some things. We need to glean some what I call practical ideas for being addicted. And I know some people have had addictions here and you're like, okay, this is an addiction I can get behind, right? And this is an, these, are, these are things that we need to do that we can all get behind. For addictions to be developed, um, science actually tells us <clears throat> that first a habit must be formed, right? You must form a habit in order to be addicted. And, and with a lot of habits, it usually takes about six months for a habit Maybe not with certain drugs. Certain drugs you're addicted right away, but with habits. So like exercise or uh, anything, you need, you need about six months to have it be established. Make it a habit, and here's, here's, here's a practical idea for being addicted to serving God's people. Make it a habit to learn the name of someone you haven't met before or maybe is attending for the first time. Right? It, it is so important to know people's names. Um, if you have to come up with some sort of game in order to remember their name, do it. Because it's so important. I, I, sometimes I'll meet somebody, and, and, then I'll, and then I'll see him like two weeks later, and I haven't seen him in church, and I'll go, what's that person's name? You know, and, and you know, I always used to have a notebook to write them down when I was a cop, but I don't carry a notebook with me anymore. The experts actually tell us that if, if we want somebody to become part of our church, that we have to at least make 11 positive touches, personal connections, on the first time they visit. Isn't that interesting? So, I mean, <clears throat> from the car to the front door to the lobby to sitting down and then after church, 11, 11 positive connections for somebody to actually even think about coming back. Isn't that amazing? Mm. They've researched this stuff. So here's, here's, here's another practical thing. Introduce yourself. Walk up to somebody maybe you don't recognize. Say, hey, my name is so-and-so. What's your name? And then, and then have, have a little more gut. Say, hey, you want to go to lunch? Now don't be weird about it. <laughs> Just say, hey, you want to go out to La Coretta? I'm plugging my favorite restaurant. Hey, you want to go out to so-and-so? Learn their names. Learn their kids' names. Like I said, don't be weird. Just be loving. And don't expect someone else to do it. Can I get an amen? amen? You know, it's your job as Jesus followers, so do your job. You know, I'm sorry. Joe will do it. Joe, you take my job today. Yeah, you know, Joe, no, okay, somebody else will do it. We don't do that. Greet those you know by name each week. It's in the Bible. And continue until you know everyone by name. As well, make it a habit to practice hospitality with one another. I love this part of 1 Peter 4, 9. Without what? Grumbling! It's easy to grumble, isn't it, folks? Invite people into your home. Accept invitations when offered because hospitality is a two-way street. 
And whatever abilities you have, use them. Use your abilities in the service of Christ to your brothers and sisters. Use them. For the goal is to become addicted to serving our church family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because once we learn how to do that, guess who else we, we will learn to be addicted to serving? Them out there. I know that's scary, but that's what God wants to do. So whether it's through serving or teaching or helping or greeting or even going out and serving some ice cream, the more we know one another and the more we grow in our abilities to serve, the easier it becomes to be addicted to the ministry of the saints. Now before we go to the table, I want us to grasp this one truth. I looked all through the Bible to find out about this guy Stephanus and his family. Do you know he's only mentioned in the Bible three times? Three times in the Bible, and it's all in the first letter to the Corinthians. Once at the beginning, chapter 1, verse 16, Paul tells people that he baptized. He actually baptized the family of Stephanus. And then in the last chapter, chapter 16, uh, he actually twice in the final chapter, chapter 16, he said, like, I am truly honored to know this family. And he honored this family as being exemplary in their addiction to serving the saints. And, and I think about this when I read this. I always think about, like, what am I going to leave behind? Like, like, when I'm gone, what is the world going to remember about me, about the Bailey name and about the ministry of the Bailey family. You know what I mean? Like, because we do, we, we think about that stuff as we want to leave a legacy. Amen? I mean, these guys, they had one of the most wonderful reputations because they were devoted. They devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. Think about that. And then they made Paul, he was so excited, he was so happy he was actually refreshed in his spirit about these folks and so we need to ask ourselves this before we go today and as we're kind of going through the week like what kind of reputation are we going to leave behind are we refreshing other spirits i mean i think that's one of the highest compliments from paul who wrote two-thirds of the new testament and Paul was the man. He did a lot of writing. And he was like, these folks refreshed my spirit. Are we devoted? Are we addicted to serving our brothers and sisters of, in Christ with love and with passion? And I really believe, I, not just this church, but every church in the world, for them to truly survive, they must be they must not be unwilling to give loving service because they're, well, they're too busy or they're not interested or, well, that's not my ministry. I don't feel comfortable with people that look like that. Or, or my favorite, it's, eh, it's not my job. They need, they need to stand up and become addicted to the ministry of the saints. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the table and uh, we'll get out of here. This... This is such a wonderful thing to actually be right on the precipice of having the communion servers come up and handing them the trays. You don't understand how cool this is for me because this hasn't happened in, in, in 18 months. But this table is such a sacred thing. The thing that we're about to do right now is one of the most incredible sacraments that we get to practice as pastors and as, as Jesus followers. You know, when, when the Lord, when he was getting ready to go to the upper room, you know, he, sent, he sent people ahead and they set it up. And it was just him and his, his 12 guys. It was a very special time. And one of the things they don't say in the word that I always like to tell people is, is this is an open table. You don't have to be part of the club. You don't have to be part of the church. You don't have to have um, membership here. This is an open table. You can come and, and 
partake in the bread and the cup, the body and the blood. The only thing that I ever say that you need to do before is that we need to take a moment in the quietness of our own hearts to ask Jesus to forgive us for anything that we may have between us and someone else. Because that's the one thing that keeps us from God is that we have sin. Sin always keeps us from, from sharing not just with him, but, but at the table. So I want to take just a second before, uh, before we uh, pray over the body and the, the bread, or the body and the blood, and I just want to take maybe 30 seconds, and if you just want to have a moment of quiet reflection yourself, if there's something between you and someone else, give it up to God. Give it up to God so there's no enmity between you and them, and then there's no separation between you and the table and you and, and the Lord. Amen? Let's just take a few seconds to do that. And then, uh, and then we'll go back to the table. Now I'm going to challenge you to do something as well. I want you, sometime in the week, go to that person that you've asked God to forgive you of that stuff. Go to that person and ask them as well. Reconciliation is one of the greatest things that we can ever have in the Christian walk. Restoring relationships, because that's what it's about. It's a relationship, amen? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he got together with his guys and he got together with his guys and he took this loaf of unleavened bread and he explained to them what was going to happen and he said this is this bread represents my body that is broken for you and then he handed pieces of the bread and he says do this in remembrance of me. And I'm going to have my communion servers come up, and Joe and the team are going to play. And go ahead and hold your piece of bread until we can all take it together, and uh, we'll, we'll partake together. As I said, when Jesus was with his guys, he, he took the bread, he broke it, he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
All to Jesus I surrender Humbly at His feet I bow Worldly pleasures All forsaken Take me Jesus Take me now I give all After they had broken bread and Jesus gave them the hope of the broken body, he grabbed the cup, and it was a communal cup. It, they shared it together, which would be crazy, I guess, in today's age. But they passed the cup around, and Jesus held it up, and he said, This represents my blood shed for you on the cross for the remission of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For as much as you do these things, we will not do them again until we are all together. And what a blessed day that will be when we are together with Jesus and the apostles and all the saints and we take communion for that first time in heaven. How amazing that will be. Amen? Yeah. Joe, will you lead us out? Well, let's stand as we close it out this morning. All to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit, truly know that thine. May God be with you today as you go out and show hospitality to the stranger and invite them to church. Get one of these cards out from the table and invite them to church and show them how much Jesus loves them. Go with God and we'll see you next week. We are dismissed. Happy Independence Day.